Hello, Living Branch family, friends, and guests. Welcome to another gathering of LBC at Home. We are grateful that you have joined us. We hope that you have had a productive week, a restful weekend, and then we also hope that this gathering is really the cherry on top of your Sunday. Hey, Preston, see what I did there? Because today's Sunday. Before we jump into some scripture, worship, and the message today, we want to make sure we give just a few special thank yous uh, to those. One who joined us last week out at the ranch. It was a beautiful evening of fun, food, family, fellowship. It was just an awesome time, and none of it would have happened had it not been for you joining us. So thank you so much for that. We also want to give a very special thank you to anybody who donated any canned goods to our food collection. We were able to put together three really big boxes that we're going to be able to donate to the village food drive that's going to help support families in our community during the holiday season so thank you so much for that and then also I love to give a special thank you to anybody who is joining us for the first time right here right now at LBC at home thank you so much for joining us we'd like to connect with you better yet again we want to connect with anybody who has not officially filled out those connect cards so it's simple get with your host they have a ton of those cards at the ready to provide to you they may even have a pen for you that you can use. That's how nice we are around here. But ultimately, you're gonna fill out that Connect card. You'll see all the information that's requesting and it provides you with additional information on LBC as a church. Pass it back to your host and then we'll be sure to reach back out to you this coming week. Now, maybe filling out a connection card just isn't your thing. Don't worry, we have you with lbctucson.com. That is our website where you're able to get all the latest and greatest information when it comes to life groups that you can join, uh, the ability to give, and even if you have any special requests or prayer needs, you can go ahead and take care of those at our website as well. But maybe you just need to get it done right here, right now. Well, we can go ahead and get it done right through your mobile device simply by texting LBC Tucson to 94000. Again, that's LBC Tucson, all one word, to 94000. There we will get all the latest and greatest information to your mobile device right this moment. So please get connected with us. That's all you're getting from me right now. Now we're going to pass it over to our friend Haley, who's going to read a little bit of scripture before today's service. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been re reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. Creation knows the Spoken to the void, the breath that brought the dust to life, and sang the stars to form. The darkness fears your voice, that drove it back. Though the night is long, I know your light will drive it back once more. One word from you, and things change on your authority.
my fight is not my own its end is in your hands I worship you because I know all things must bow to your command and one Still my 
Thanks again for joining us for another week of LBC at Home. It's crazy to think this is already our fourth time uh, gathering uh, for LBC at Home. And of course, last Sunday, uh, many of you joined us out at the ranch and it was just an unbelievably uh, sweet time together. Uh, we hope you were as blessed to be there as we were to have you there. And uh, we're targeting November 15th as kind of the next uh, opportunity for us to be out at the ranch together. And you'll hear, you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. Now, whether you were with us at a prior LBC at home, or you were with us even last week at the ranch, or for some of you, maybe both, um, you know that we've been kind of walking our way through this series called Starting Point, exploring the basics of the gospel. And admittedly, we've kind of been dangling this carrot of good news out in front of you along the way. And good news is, of course, what the word gospel means. And so all the way from week one, onward, we've, we've been anticipating this good news uh, that is the promise of the gospel, and it's kind of set up this larger narrative for us. In week one, we established that a good God created a good creation. And then in week two, we, we established the truth that every human being is an image bearer of God, albeit imperfect at times. And then in week three, we considered uh, the story of Genesis 3 and the fall of man, that moment in history when man first rebelled against God and it fractured and broke that relationship between man and his creator. And then of course, last week out at the ranch, we moved to Genesis four and we looked at the story of Cain and Abel and how uh, Cain's uh, anger towards his brother drove him to murder. And we, and we established the curse that the whole world, or I should say we established the truth that the whole world lives under the curse of sin. And we saw that evidence, of course, in how it was passed in just one generation from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel. And we established that there is not one person or one part of God's creation that is that escapes from the curse of sin. Now, last Sunday, we also did something a little bit um, unusual. We kind of jumped out of the, the linear trajectory of our, of our series, and we jumped ahead a little bit to extend the good news to those who are with us who maybe have never placed their faith in Jesus. And maybe that's even some of you who are watching today. And we want to say, we want to be clear that we are thrilled that you have joined us. But for today's purposes, I do want to backtrack just a bit. And I and I want to drill down on kind of on this next piece in our series, which is something that we kind of jumped over or glossed over rather quickly last week at our ranch gathering. And so for the next few minutes, I want to kind of take a deeper dive on this. And here's the thing, as we've been journeyed along in this series, there's been a noticeable missing piece. But as you'll see today, this is where the story begins to pick up that missing piece. This is where it begins to pick up kind of that central character in the person of Jesus. And as we've been considering, all all that we've considered over the last four weeks has been in anticipation that at some point the story would shift towards Jesus and the curtain would be lifted and standing there center stage would be the main character, the character of Jesus. Well, we're now at that part of the story. But first, thinking back, the context that kind of has brought us to this point, first, a good God created a good and perfect creation, which he entrusted to perfect human beings who were fashioned and made in his image, and yet they willfully chose to rebel against God, thereby initiating a genetic generational curse 
passed first, of course, of course, to Cain and Abel, and then on to every human being that has ever lived since then. And so that's the backdrop that sets us up for today. And our big idea, and this is really what I want you to lock in on with me for the next few minutes. Here's what I want us to grasp, and that is this, that the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus breaks the curse of sin. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus breaks the curse of sin. Now that's a lot at a theological level to try and tackle, isn't it? And it is. But I want us to briefly look at just each of these three components because each of these components is critical to the larger picture and the larger story of the gospel. If you take out any of these three pieces, if you take out the life of Jesus or the death of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus, you you completely change the gospel. And so let's consider these individually and let's begin first, of course, with just the life of Jesus. Here's the crazy thing about it. Jesus, although fully God and also uh, the Son of God, He was also fully man. He was a full human. He was a real human. He had real flesh and blood. He had bones. He had facial features. He had emotions. He had feelings. He experienced all the same things that we experience as humans. Moments of joy, moments of sorrow, moments of pain, whatever it means to be human, Jesus experienced that except for sin, which we'll hit on in just a moment. But it's important that we understand out of the gate here that that Jesus was an actual human being and he lived the life of an actual human being. And there are a number of places in the Bible where we find this truth supported. I want to read for us just a couple of them. First in the Gospel of John. So that's one of the four Gospel accounts in the New Testament. In the very first chapter, in chapter 1, This is what it says in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was God. That's where everything got its start. But then check it out. It goes down into verse 14, John chapter 1, and it continues. The Word, so we understand that to be God, became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we should ask, well, how have we seen the glory of God? And the answer, according to John chapter 1, is that we've seen it in the person of Jesus. As God took on human form in the person of Jesus and lived amongst us as a human, living a human life. Now, later in the New Testament, in a letter written by by Paul to the church in a place called Galatia, it's in, it's in the book of Galatians chapter 4, Verse 4, it says this, But when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman. Now, I probably don't need to explain to you that if you have a mother who gave birth to you, congratulations, that makes you a human being. And such was Jesus. Now, we should ask, could God have created or breathed Jesus into existence or waved a magic wand or or any of those things. Certainly he could have. Jesus could have come about in any number of different ways, but Jesus's physical birth by a woman, by another human, gave him a human nature, just like us. And if we had more time, we could walk through the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we would see over and over again that Jesus experienced all the same things that we do as humans. He knew pain. He knew sorrow. He knew joy. He even knew what it was like to be hungry and thirsty. He was a child first, and then he was a teen, and then he was a man. And the reality of is that much of Jesus's life probably looks similar to your life and to mine. And here's something interesting and worth noting is that if you were to survey people around the world, just ask them a, their opinion about Jesus, people of different cultures or ethnicities, people of different religions, even people of no religious affiliation, almost nobody disputes that Jesus lived a human life. Jesus is almost unanimously accepted as this moral, historical figure who lived on earth. But it's also important to note that at this point, different camps begin to emerge as we consider the question of, okay, so what? Is there anything more to his life than that he just lived? I mean, billions of people billions of humans have lived on the earth. What makes him unique? In other words, what was the significance of Jesus's life? 
Couldn't God have just never sent Christ in the first place? Certainly. He could have done whatever he wanted. He still could. The plan was God's to create and to execute. And so if that's the case, if God could have done this any way he wanted, then because God the Father did send Jesus as a human, then we have to consider the why. Why did Jesus come and live a human life on earth? Well, I think the answer to that question is summed up really well for us in another scripture in the Bible. It comes later in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. So towards the end of the Bible, in chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, let me read it for us. It says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, meaning they're humans, he too shared in their humanity. In other words, Jesus had to have the same humanity. He had to be human like them. Why? Well, we get the answer as we keep reading. So that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. So that's another way, way of saying it's not for angels that Jesus was sent to earth to help, but rather humans. That's who Jesus helps. Verse 17, for this reason, he had to be made like them. He had to be fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And here comes the why, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So the answer to the question we asked a moment ago, why did Jesus have to live a human life is summed up in this passage for us so that he could make atonement for the sins of the people. Now, what does that mean? Atonement is kind of a, a fancy theological term. Well, let me summarize it for us in just kind of a few short sentences. The Old Testament, which is kind of that time in, in, the, in the Bible that we read about before Jesus, before there was a physical Jesus on earth, that's the Old Testament. And all of the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, forgiveness of sins came about through this sacrificial system. In other words, Animals were taken to the temple, they were killed, and the blood of the sacrifice of the animal was used to make atonement for sins. It was used to cover the sins of the people. That's what Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So that was the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Okay, so if we jump ahead then to the New Testament, to the time of Jesus, if shedding of blood is the means of forgiveness... Well, then guess what, Jesus? That means you also have to shed your blood because the rules haven't changed, just the sacrifice has. And now, instead of it being an animal sacrifice, it's a sacrifice of a human being, in this case, Jesus. But here's something that is absolutely critical for us to know and to understand. Only Jesus could do it because he did not have a sin nature. That's the only reason he was able to sacrifice his life for our sins. The reason that I can't die in your place to forgive your sins is because I have sins of my own. The reason that you can't die in my place for my sins is because you have sins of your own. I mean, parents, think about it. We would love to be able to do that for our kids or on behalf of our kids, but the reality is, is we have our own sins. And if Jesus has sin, then we might as well stick with the animal sacrificial system, right? And blood is blood, right? Right. But Jesus was different. He had no sin nature and therefore it allowed him to shed his own blood and to be that sacrifice for us. Now at the beginning of, of this service, you heard our friend Haley read from Romans chapter 5 verses 6 to 11. Let me read again just a select portion of it. It says this beginning in verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, note, it's no longer an animal's blood. It's now the blood of Jesus. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Jesus could die in our place because he had no sin of his own. And according to this passage, it served to restore, or the word that's used here is to reconcile 
that fractured relationship that happened in the garden in Genesis 3 between man and his creator. So if you're tracking with us, earlier we established our big idea that the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus breaks the curse of sin. Okay, so we've got two of the three pieces in place. If you don't have a physical life, you don't have a physical death. But before we move on from this second tenant here, I want to make sure that when we talk about Jesus' death, that we understand it in the same way. That in the same way that he lived a human life, he also died a human death. And several places in the Bible affirm this very truth for us. I want to read a few. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, I'm just going to read a few select portions of it. Beginning in verse 32, it says this, And they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So they're in the process of killing his physical body. Jump down to verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar and he put it on a staff and he offered it up to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And, and when Jesus had cried out again, this is verse 50, in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. In other words, he died. And then verse 57, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus's body, that's key, and Pilate offered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and he placed it in its own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and he went away. So we have here the actual account of Jesus' death. First, hung on a cross, then died a physical death, and then his lifeless body put into a tomb. Very similar to the process that happens when we die. And I I wanted to take the time to read this account because we have to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what we're talking about when we say, that Jesus died. This wasn't a spiritual death. It wasn't an imaginary death. It wasn't a partial death where maybe he was dead for one minute and then came back to life. This was a human death, a lifeless body taken down from the cross, prepared for burial, and then sealed into a tomb. Now, why does this matter? Well, two reasons. First, because as we established earlier, this was necessary for the curse of sin to be broken. That's the primary reason. There had to be the shedding of blood, the giving of life. Secondly, because it enriches and it intensifies this third and final piece, which is the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, because Jesus' death was real, because there came a point where his physical body actually died, it stopped breathing from a, from a medical or biological perspective, he died well, then his resurrection is all the more miraculous because that's not the typical outcome when someone dies. And so let me read briefly the account of the resurrection, which is found in in several different places in the New Testament. I'm going to read it mostly out of Matthew 28, where it says this, beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He was killed. He is not here. He is risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So so the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And then suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, notice that he's talking, so he's alive. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. 
Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, I'm going to jump us ahead to the book of Acts, just a little further into the New Testament. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it says this, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote all about Jesus, all of that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. Now listen to this part, verse 3. After his suffering, in other words, after his death, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Okay, so what I just read for us is the historical account of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, evidenced by his appearing to eyewitnesses that he was indeed alive. It wasn't just a myth that was being circulated, but real life witnesses who saw Jesus, who touched Jesus after his resurrection. And it happened over a period of 40 days. It wasn't like a 30 second dream or flash where someone could dispute it. Many people over many days. Now, the danger here for us in this part of the story is to see the miraculous, but to miss the meaning. In other words, our natural response to Jesus' resurrection, because those that die just typically do not come back to life, is to go, wow, this is a miracle. And indeed it is. But listen, it is more than just a miracle. It is also a necessity. What do I mean by that? Well, if there is no resurrection, Jesus does not defeat death. And if Jesus does not defeat death, then he is no different than us and his death was in vain, and his death would go down and be recorded in the history books, just like the billions of other people who will live on the earth and die a physical death. In the book of 1 Corinthians, a book written by Paul, in chapter 15, verse 14, it says this, And if Christ has not been raised, in other words, if there's no resurrection, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. In other words, If Jesus doesn't rise from the dead, there is nothing to believe then. There is no such thing as Christianity. LBC at home is a a gigantic waste of your time. But because he did, and we have the historical proof of that, the power of death is defeated. Now, I read for you earlier Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm going to read it again, just the very first portion of it, to hear it afresh. This um, This is verse 14, speaking of what Jesus does for us. It says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. He defeated death through his resurrection, but there has to be a resurrection in order for that to happen. Now, I know I've kind of shotgunned a lot of different Bible verses and scriptures at us today, but I hope that in your mind's eye, you can kind of begin to piece this together because there had to be first a physical life in order for there to be a physical death. And the physical death is what gives way to the physical resurrection. If there is no, there is no physical resurrection, if there is no physical death, and there is no physical death, if there is not first a physical life. And so these things intersect and you cannot separate them from one another without changing the gospel. And all of this, all of this is so that the curse of sin would be forever broken and we would know the gift of forgiveness and eternal life in Christ Jesus. Recently, I was, uh, my sister visited us and some of you may know her story. Many of you probably don't, but with her permission, I'm just going to give you the very, very short version of her story. Some number of years ago, Within about a four and a half month period of time, my sister lost two children. First, it was uh, my nephew Isaac, who my sister tragically uh, lost as a full-term stillborn, just a few days shy of her delivery date. And then about four or five months later, my nephew Gabriel, who was uh, nine years old at the time, passed away. And so in four short months, you have two children gone to heaven. And so when we're with my sister, as we were recently, uh, we often find ourselves remembering not only the good things about the boys and some of those sweet memories that we shared, but we, of course, also talk about just some of the pain and the hardship that marked that season of life for, for my sister and for our family. 
And I'm always reminded as we spend time talking about that, that the hardest thing about death is that it's permanent. That's what makes death so hard. That's what makes it so hard when we lose people we love. Sickness we can manage, sickness we can get through, but death is permanent and death hurts. And yet if we go back to Genesis 3, where we were just a few weeks ago in our our journey, we see again, as we did then, that part of man's punishment for disobeying God was the certainty of physical death. That's a hard and yet a real consequence of the fall of man, of man's choice to disobey God. And that, that result of the fall is a part of life for us still today. People still die. Now, in the case of my two nephews who died, was it in response to their sin directly? I don't believe so, no. But it is a reality, whether you're still in the womb or whether you're nine years old, or whether you're 89 years old, it is still a reality of living in a fallen world. There are things like sickness and premature death, and there are really hard things in life. And the natural emotions surrounding death, particularly when it's a young child or it feels premature, is extreme grief and sorrow. And yet, the promise of the gospel and the the hope that his life and death and resurrection brings us is that the curse of sin will be broken, which includes what? Death. Listen later in the Bible, there's a a book called Revelation, um, which is this futuristic look at the promises of God and the plan of God to how he's going to wrap up life on this physical earth. It won't always look this way. And in the second to the last chapter of the Bible, so this is Revelation 21, listen to the promise of God in verse 4. It says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Those former things are a part of life today for us. Life on earth is marked by two hard realities, death and sorrow. But the good news of the gospel is that both of those things, which are a result of the curse of sin that the whole world lives under at the moment, will be permanently eliminated by Jesus and in Jesus. I know that many of you are watching this right now as a part of LBC at home, you're gathered with others. And I myself have participated every week in these gatherings and and am, and I I am again this week, but I know what it's like to be there. And I know that the tendency is when your host hits stop on the recording uh, to just kind of grab some food and scurry on your way. But I wanna encourage you today to kind of sit in this thought and to maybe dialogue it, dialogue about it with someone who's seated near you or as you're sharing some food together. And that thought is this, what's something hard that you're carrying right now in life that you need to let go and surrender to Jesus and allow him to carry it for you? The hard things in life are a result of the world being under the curse of sin. And while none of us will ever get through this earthly life without feeling the effects of those hard things, Jesus does promise us hope and strength when we come to him that he will get us through those things. And this is all because the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus breaks the curse of sin. That's why we have hope. That's why we persevere in the midst of hard days. Now, if you're watching this and you have a relationship with Jesus, which I suspect most of you who are watching this do, this, some of this may be a review for you. But perhaps today you realize that you're carrying something that you need to release and to find rest in the finished work that Jesus has already done for you through his life and his death and his resurrection. If you're watching this today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, nothing would thrill us more than to be able to answer your questions and to kind of join you in your journey to explore who is Jesus and what does he want have to do with me? What does he care about my life? And so wherever you're watching this, if that's true of you, there are those around you, whether it's your host or whether it's somebody who invited you uh, to be a part of LBC at home, um, whoever it is that they would love to help you discover for yourself what it means to have a relationship with Jesus and the truth that his life, his death, and his resurrection break the curse of sin. And so that's a good stopping point for today, but next week we're going to pick it back up in this series. And we're going to look at specifically what it means that Jesus calls us to faith and to repentance in him. And so we look forward to being together with you again 
next week.
This is my confidence. You've never failed me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never. 